Welcome to the 26th Annual Undergraduate Communication Research Conference. Glad you all could be here. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the first couple of sessions, um, and I hope you're looking forward to our keynote speaker today. Dispatches from the Color Line, the Press, and Multiracial America. As you might tell from these titles, and what I notice and admire about Dr. Squires' work, is her desire to grapple with the sort of messy, up-to-the-minute cultural politics of mediated representations of race and gender. I think it takes some scholarly bravery to tackle topics that are literally shifting ground under you. Back when Obama was running for president, before he was even elected, Dr. Squires organized the Obama Effect Conference in the fall of 2008, bringing together scholars, politicians, journalists, to look at the significance of Obama's rise. This is where I first met Dr. Squires. The conference had quite the energy and buzz about it, as we were all trying to understand this moment of race in American politics. I can say that many of the Obama conference participants shared cautionary notes in proclaiming a post-racial society on the heels of the Obama victory. And here we are today. Here we are, yes. Um, on a personal note, since meeting Dr. Squires, um, she has been quite generous with her time with me letting me pick her brain about these issues, and I'm a better teacher and um, thinker for these conversations, so thank you. Um, now, on top of all that scholarship, um, as if you know, theorizing the um, shifting cultural terrain of race and gender politics is not enough, um, Dr. Squires also engages in community research. She works on projects that address education inequality in Minnesota, She's been working with St. Paul's Gordon Parks High School, creating teams of teachers, or teachers and students who develop media that showcase the history and development of the Frogtown and Rondo neighborhoods. And just last week, I was so excited to see that Dr. Squires was recognized for all of her accomplishments when she was awarded the prestigious um, Bush Fellowship, which comes with a two-year $100,000 grant. According to the Bush Foundation president, Bush Fellows are extraordinary leaders who make significant contributions to their communities, and the Bush Fellowship is both a recognition of their accomplishments and a bet on their potential to make an even bigger impact on our region. Dr. Squires wants to use the fellowship to transform schools into spaces of intentional inter intergenerational learning and healing, bringing together underserved youth, adults, elders to reflect, share stories, reclaim their heritage, and repair broken bonds. Doesn't that sound original and necessary, Ray? Um, she wants youth to learn directly from the stories of elders and to make connections between historical challenges and contemporary issues. And that's exactly what Dr. Squires is going to do for us today. She's going to examine black feminism through Harriet Tubman to Brie Newsome making connections between the historic and the contemporary. So I'm honored to present to you Dr. Squires, who will deliver this year's keynote address titled, Resisting Respectability, Affirming Dignity, Learning from Harriet, Rosa, Sandra, and Bree. Thank you, Dr. Squires. So I revised the title slightly. Um, and, and thanks for that amazing introduction, Dina. I'm like all verklempt. <laughs> so hopefully I make it through this. I really am honored to be here today and see all of you young scholars with these amazing projects and thinking about the issues of our time through the lens of communication theory, using all these different methods. It's really great to have an opportunity to try out some new ideas I'm playing around with, with uh, the next generation of scholars who are going to shape our field. So we look forward to having you in our ranks in the near future. So why this title and this topic? Um, I've been really troubled in the past few years, especially uh, listening to how people are talking about the protest movements that have emerged um, in the past four to five years. I'm troubled by the way people make comparisons between the respectful protesters of the 1950s civil rights movement and protests today led by a new generation 
of activists. So I've been wondering why, after so many decades of critique and amassing of evidence of continued injustices along the lines of race and gender and sexuality, why is it so easy for people to fixate on the alleged mannerisms of the protesters and the activists instead of focusing on the injustices that they're struggling against or the mannerisms and behaviors of those who make unjust decisions and justify deadly acts? And so it led me to revisit scholarship on public memory and media and think about how we learn the stories of who we are how we got here, and how those stories shape our sensibilities of to whom we owe our freedom and allegiance, to whom we owe respect, and to whom we might owe a debt, and whether or not that debt has actually been paid in full. Because one of the major interventions of the Black Lives Matter movement has been to center black women, whether they be cisgender, queer, young, old, et cetera, and to acknowledge the leadership of black women as central to the success of freedom struggles, I decided to explore these four women's stories to think about how we remember and acknowledge black women in regards to struggles against racist systems and sexist systems, and using black feminist and cultural studies theories to narrativize stories of black women in struggle in a way that might counter the dominant narratives of black struggle and why their lives matter. So first I'm briefly going to define the politics of respectability and how these politics work as a disciplining force on black women then and now. And then I'm going to outline how dominant public memories, many of which are transmitted through media as well as education systems, how these dominant public memories of civil rights milestones and heroines obscure the violence of racial hierarchy. These memories create a discourse of steady racial progress and respectable individuals from the Emancipation Proclamation to the Montgomery bus boycott to Obama's election that produces a usable past that's often deployed to dismiss contemporary struggles against racial inequality as unnecessary. I use the dominant discourse surrounding Rosa Parks on the bus here as an exemplar of how these dominant narratives flatten and narrow and create a nostalgia that really reduces our understanding of the meaning of struggles for racial equality and what people are actually struggling against. Third, I'm going to draw on Hazel Carby's understanding of using a historical detour to make a creative friction in our understanding of race, particularly in thinking about the ways racial identity is produced in encounters. That is, a racial identity or our racial identities only exist within relations and relationships. Which encounters between racialized others in the past we choose to examine and make use of in the present will in part determine how we understand our relationships, roles, and identities today. So after I go through this theory stuff, I'm then going to do a little experimental exercise in re-narration of these four women's stories. So I want to re-narrate Rosa Parks' story by weaving it and looking at everyday encounters that don't necessarily include the most famous encounters we think about when we think about people like Harriet Tubman and Rosa Parks. I'm trying to stitch together a pattern that challenges dominant renderings of how Rosa Parks became an icon and hope that this pattern might provide a useful and different way of relating to these women as well as relating them to each other, thereby articulating a different kind of usable past to relate to contemporary struggles for justice. Looking to encounters produces knowledge that can engender a nonlinear understanding of progress to spark our imagination of what we could be, what we could have been, what we should have done in the past, and thus suggesting action and alternatives for the future. So historian Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham is one of the first people to really nail down respectability politics. And she defines it as a politics wherein African Americans are urged to have the appearance of conformity to the dominant white society's norms of manners and morals, such as propriety, restrained religiosity, family values, and traditional gender roles. 
Now, while black women activists have always strategically used uh, respectability, particularly in the late 19th and early 20th century, as a means to call out hypocrisies of Jim Crow and alleged white Southern chivalry, this strategy was always a double-edged sword, even when used by such skilled practitioners as Ida B. Wells. Because the implicit and sometimes explicit bargain of, of uh, respectability politics is that until the masses of black people can exhibit respectability, whites had no reason or need to respect any individual one of them, let alone recognize their legal and human rights. Herman Gray summarizes how respectability politics continue to have purchase into the 21st century, impacting black life as it effectively structures and rationalizes the claim that something in the black cultural, moral, social, and political community requires regulation and policing in order to realize black advancement and inclusion in society. Though most people no longer use biological racism, except for Steve King, as a means to explain racial inequality, black respectability, particularly in regards to culture and behavior and criminality, is still used as a yardstick by many to say that claims to equality and dignity are not valid. While respectability can temporarily frame particular black people as deserving better treatment, the politics of respectability actually establish what Paisley Harris calls a behavioral entrance fee for the right to respect and the right to full citizenship, which serves as a gatekeeping that skirts issues of patriarchy, race, colorism, and sexual difference. Refusing respectability, then, is a way to refuse the relations prescribed by the politics of respectability, a politics premised on white supremacy. Being unapologetically black and female is a form of resistance that many undertake at risk of life to life and livelihood every day. From the woman who wears dreadlocks despite being told that she will be written up for dress code violations, to the young girls who have been body slammed by school security when they haven't responded to orders of police officer exactly the way they wanted them to, black women and girls face a particular setup where our words, facial expressions, voice tone, clothing, hair, movement, gestures, and eye rolls are presumed guilty, deficient, and defiant in the eyes of many beholders. In other words, the burden of proof is always on black people to show themselves worthy of citizenship and social regard, which puts the power, of course, out of their hands. So this is why the politics of respectability cannot and does not generate sustainable relations of respect and dignity within or across race, gender, and sexuality lines. In a respectability politics system, blackness and femaleness and queerness require monitoring, surveillance, and disciplining to ensure compliance with respectability norms. This is also why historical narratives that frame individuals like Rosa Parks as respectable are insidious and, cons and support conservative views of black freedom struggles that obfuscate the violence of racial hierarchy and suggest that contemporary inequalities and injustices require neither public attention nor remedy. So I'm not the first historian to argue that the histories of black freedom movements from slavery through the height of the 1950s uh, nonviolent protests have never really fully been told in terms of the risk of extreme violence and violations that occurred in everyday life, not just during demonstrations or riots. This is particularly problematic in textbooks and popular culture translations of slavery and Jim Crow. As late as the 1950s, for example, California textbooks conveyed lessons about slavery with passages such as this. Perhaps the most fun the little masters and mistresses have comes when they are free to play with the little colored boys and girls. So this was a description of life on a plantation from a textbook in California in 1950. Now, of course, in Alabama, the textbooks taught that Reconstruction was an abomination where ignorant former slaves ran rampant across the South and believed that they could take possession of land by laying magic sticks on the ground, end quote. 
Um, this required, quote, loyal white men to protect their families, formed the Ku Klux Klan to be, bring back law and order, end quote. Now these types of histories were typical, either playing up the alleged benevolence of slavery or the alleged savagery of the formerly enslaved. Other textbooks throughout the 60s, 70s, and 80s just either glossed over slavery as a brief aberration in our democratic nation, or that it was overcome by inevitable changes wrought by the Industrial Revolution and steadfast belief in democracy and equality. Whether you're going with the uh, very rabidly racist or the skating over the facts, all of these narratives craft a usable path that suggests not only the nation has gotten over the stain of slavery, but also that slavery was not actually that much of a hardship for black people. Oftentimes it's portrayed as a quote, civilizing, Christianizing force that taught the value of hard work or impulse control. Once the yoke of slavery and legalized white control was gone, new means for extra legal control were necessary to suppress the savage element. So if you grew up reading these kinds of textbooks or watched movies like these, then, you know, it would come as no surprise that growing up in the 50s and 60s, reading and watching stuff like this, maybe you would say things like this. So most recently, slavery and immigration are the same thing, according to Ben Carson. Right, um, Steve King has been doing this for quite some time. Um, so this idea that slavery wasn't so bad, that, that black people got something out of it, um, et cetera, is, is a theme that just refuses to die. And it's gotten new inflammation with the empowerment of uh, you know, white supremacists and their communication channels with this new administration. Um, so, Believing these sorts of things, right, might make it understandable that using this kind of version of the past, you might expect black people to prove they've risen above savagery, to prove that they have assimilated to those superior ways. And so this is where dominant distortions of the history of slavery and the struggle to make black lives matter meet with respectability politics. So again, I'm not the first person to comment on the ways conservative framing of civil rights and abolition movements displace the complexity of black community organization and the uh, intensity of violence, let alone the crucial contributions of black women. But what I wanna do today beyond that critique is to explore theoretical and imaginative tools that we can use to retell movements for black lives, not so we see 1954 and 2014 as the same struggle, but so we can see how, why, and what people struggled for and against. The homogenizing nostalgia that infuses most stories of civil rights heroes and sheroes, however, does not do this work, thereby obscuring and reinforcing the systems and setups that, as philosopher Christy Dotson puts it, make black women's lives shorter and more difficult. So here's the iconic image of Rosa Parks, which of course was recycled for Apple computers a few years back. Um, and I just wanna shout out to uh, the design of the program for not using this photo and actually using the photo of uh, the mugshot instead. So this iconic image of Parks, which people recognize worldwide, is actually a staged encounter. This was a photo setup um, that was created after the bus boycott. The encounter is really interesting, as Fackler and others have argued, that of course it can be read in many ways, as we all know from our uh, media classes, that people bring their own baggage to any particular photo. But most often it is used to uh, comfort. It's a very comforting image of racial progress. It looks like a big win for black people, but it's clearly a win that doesn't shake things up too much. Rosa Parks is sitting quietly on an almost empty bus, and she is separate, if actually in front of, a white man, and they're not even making eye contact with each other. So Fackler and others read this image as a respectable one, 
that suggests that desegregation is not going to lead to too much trouble. There's not gonna be race mixing, there's just gonna be sort of this stoic tolerance of each other. And notice there's no other people in the frame, right? Rosa is not bringing the black masses to the front of the bus with her. She's sitting alone. There's no future demand in sight, right? And of course, Apple, and I actually used the picture from the Apple ad, used her as one of the series of these thinkers, people th who think different, right? Which positions her even more as an individual, as a maverick, rather than as part of a collective, a community. In children's books and textbooks, she is similarly individualized and separated out. And she's also reduced, right? Um, Herbert Cole did a really great content analysis of every textbook entry he could find about the Montgomery bus boycott and Rosa Parks, and also every children's book written about her between 1976 and the year 2000. And what he found without exception was that these narratives frame her as an exceptional individual that has no real tie to any community organizations, let alone pass, except for like passing references to the NAACP. Um, they depict her as a tired old lady um, who was just tired and sort of accidentally changed history. Um, moreover, these narratives avoid any direct mention of the moral and legal realities of Jim Crow. Um, some of them do this equivocation like, quote, uh, segregation means African Americans and European Americans aren't allowed to use the same facilities as if both were prohibited from those facilities with equal consequences. And this wasn't just books for little kids. Um, he found these themes in high school and AP history textbooks as well. So this is how the politics of respectability and individualization get intertwined with the politics of public memory. The framing and gatekeeping of narratives that are to be included, which historical paths and encounters are mapped out for the majority of us to see and incorporate into our understanding of the meanings of the intersections of race and racism, gender and sexism in our nation's story. If we have even such a limited picture, picture of even these bold individuals who became known for resisting injustice, how can we understand and imagine resistance against injustice in other circumstances that might not seem so stark in the present and the future? So the reduction of Rosa Parks' involvement in the bus boycott to an isolated story of one moment on a bus displaces her not only from decades of organized resistance, but also her own thoughts and feelings and embodied experience with Jim Crow segregation. People who consume these limited stories are steered away from understanding why Rosa Parks was willing to risk defying segregation, and also why she rightly feared for her life when white police officers arrested her and put her in a cell on December 1st, 1955, for the crime of sitting on a public bus in a seat a white driver said she could not sit in. Okay. And just a little note, um, this mugshot was not even recovered until 2004. So again, that politics of respectability that nobody really wanted to look for pictures of Rosa Parks in jail until very recently as you know, new biographies of her are coming out to highlight her activism. This idea that it's just not a good idea to show the mugshot, this sanitized version of her is better. Okay. So, we really do need to excavate and look at other encounters that Rosa Parks had on buses, in train stations, or as a child, where we see her rejecting the quiet, respectable expectations that were used to stifle dissent as a weapon against people who do not conform. Consider all of the calls for, uh, by critics for Black Lives Matter activists to pull up your pants and get a job before actually da daring to protest police shootings, right? Or require youth to stop wearing hoodies if you don't want people to think you're suspicious. Trayvon Martin and countless others were viewed as looking not respectable, up to no good. 
the link between respectability politics and criminalizing blackness, where criminalized identities are assumed, is very, very strong. And this is why it's dangerous to tell the stories of civil rights icons and its iconic moments through the lens of respectability politics, because those usable pasts are frameworks for understanding the range and reach of problems, they gauge the urgency for solutions, and they help to determine or frame who deserves protection or assistance in the present moment. So now I'm gonna turn to the idea of critical detours, which I take from Hazel Carby's reading of Stuart Hall. Um, Stuart Hall observed that we live with and in the midst of the consequences of creating a highly exclusive and exclusionist national identity. In places like Britain and the US, the multiple ways in which the creation and recreation of national identities are dependent upon the invention of racialized others has been repressed and denied. Thus, Hazel Carby insists we make critical detours into the past to understand our present moment and our future. What is at stake is what we will make of our cultural identities in that future. Part of making critical detours is understanding that progress is not a given and not necessarily even evident in the moments where people are enacting resistance to oppression. Though we often retroactively identify tipping points, at the time that those events occurred, there was often no sense that change was imminent, mainly because violent repression was always so successful, right? And had gone unpunished for decades, if not centuries. So Hazel Carby uh, thinks about taking these critical detours and looking at moments of encounter because race is produced in encounters and we should understand race as a relationship, not a thing that exists unto itself. So we should take detours to examine encounters where actors assert or defy relationships structured by white supremacy and its expectations of respectability. If we examine interracial encounters with attention to the relationships and the assumptions in which they are embedded, we can pause to consider the potential for transforming that relationship, and thus the potential to change not only how we understand the past, but ourselves and our identities and our investments as they exist in our present day systems of racial hierarchy. So in this spirit, I've done an experimental uh, uh, timeline a nonlinear timeline where I bring these four women in the title together, even though they neither lived nor worked at the same time together. Um, and I try to loop through encounters that Rosa Parks and Harriet Tubman highlighted themselves when they told their own stories. Uh, and these encounters that they tell and make central as they speak their own words that are often overlooked or omitted from dominant uh, renderings of anti-slavery and civil rights movements. I bring together multiple threatening encounters that could have gone another way and did so for so many other black women. It was not respectability that saved three of the four women in the title of my talk from death. So as I go through this timeline, I invite you to consider what happens when a black woman asserts her human dignity to a white agent with power? What could happen if those white agents did not continue to follow a white supremacist script to react to these black women? How did those agents have knowledge that any violence they inflicted on black women would likely go unpunished? And how did that impact their choices? In other words, I want you to think about the contexts these encounters take place in versus the reputation or character of the individuals in that encounter. I want you to think about how that context makes it more or less likely to end badly for the black, the black woman in the encounter. 1950. Rosa Parks accompanies her friend who is traveling with her two daughters to the train station. She was asked to help them be seen off safely on a trip. Rosa was walking a little farther behind the family when a policeman asked her if she had a ticket. She told him no. He shoved her into a railing and said, if you don't have a ticket, you can't go further. 
she looked at him and saw he had a billy club and a gun. 1827. Edward Brodus rents his six-year-old slave, Harriet Tubman, out to a Mr. James Cook to generate income for his estate. Mr. Cook makes Harriet check muskrat traps in a swamp, a treacherous job even for adults. The traps are set into waist-high swamp water, and as she checks them, the trapped muskrats bite her hands, making them bleed. Harriet got measles from wading in the dirty swamp water to check traps. 2014, Sandra Bland arrives at the intake room of Harris County Jail to begin sitting out parking fines she cannot pay. There is a hole in the floor to serve as a toilet and no privacy. The smell of urine is overwhelming. 1835. Harriet Tubman is doing errands for her mistress at a general store that sits at a crossroads. As Tubman exits the store, she sees a white overseer chasing after a black male slave. The overseer throws a heavy piece of iron at the man, but misses, hitting 13-year-old Harriet in the, he the head. The iron weight hits her skull with such force, a piece of the cloth shawl she is wearing on her head is driven into her skull. She is unconscious for two days. She suffers seizures and has visions for the rest of her life. 10, 2015. State Trooper Brian Encina pulls Sandra Bland over, allegedly for not signaling a lane change. He tells her to put out her cigarette. She asks, why do I have to do that? He tells her to get out of the car. When she refuses, stating that she knows her rights, the trooper starts to open the door and grabs her. She yells, don't touch me, I'm not under arrest. He then threatens Sandra with his taser, saying he will light her up if she doesn't obey him. The dash cam records her telling him, you're going to break my wrist. Winter 1943. Rosa Parks gets on a bus through the front door in Montgomery, Alabama, because the, black, the back door is blocked by the crowded black riders who are standing in the aisle because there are no seats for them to take in the back of the bus anymore. Rosa takes a seat in the middle. The white bus driver shouts at her to go back out the door and in through the back door and stay in the back. There is no one sitting in the middle rows of seats. It is the driver's discretion to decide where the color line actually is on the bus. He decides it is where it is. He gets up, grabs Rosa by the coat sleeve, Standing over her, he says, get off my bus. She looks at him, and she thinks he's going to hit her. She says, I will get off. I know one thing, you better not hit me. Fall 1865. On a train in New Jersey, a white conductor accuses Harriet Tubman of holding a fraudulent ticket and fraudulent identification papers. He grabs her and tries to force her off of the train car. She resists. The conductor gets three other white passengers to help kick her out. The men attack her, shouting insults, and the other passengers jeer at her. The men twist her arms behind her back, back so hard they dislocate one of her shoulders. They throw her into a luggage car, where she suffers injuries to her ribs and her face because luggage keeps slamming into her body. July 12, 2015. Sandra Bland doesn't eat prison breakfast. She cries continuously and uses the intercom in her cell to beg the officers to let her make another phone call. They deny her a second call. They insist she would have to pay to get access to the phone. Sandra has no money. The woman in the cell next to her hears Sandra sobbing day and night. December 1st, 1955. At the police station, white officers refused to let Rosa Parks make a phone call. 
a white prison matron walks her to a cell where two other black women are being held. Rosa asks the matron, when can I make a phone call? It's my right. The matron says, I don't know, I'm not sure, and leaves. One of the other women in the cell starts a conversation with Rosa. She has been in jail for 50 days and has had no success trying to make a call to her brother. July 10th, 2015. Sandra Bland tells the officers at the prison that she has suffered depression and once attempted suicide. They lock her up without initiating protocols for inmates with suicidal thoughts or mental health issues. December 1st, 1955. Rosa Parks is walked into the police station by the officers. She asks for water. She is standing right next to a water fountain. One white police officer says yes, but just as she bends her head toward the fountain, the other white police officer says, you can't drink no water, you have to wait until you get into the jail. Sometime in 1840, Harriet Tubman hears rumors on the plantation that Mr. Brodus is going to sell her brother or sister to pay some of his debts. She begins to have dreams of horsemen riding through the slave cabins, snatching babies from their mothers. June 27, 2015, South Carolina State Police threaten to electrify the flagpole that Bree Newsom is scaling, shouting at her as she climbs that they're going to use their tasers to electrify the pole and electrocute her. White people in the crowd yell encouragement to the police to electrocute that bitch. July 13th, jailers find Sandra Bland dead in her cell. They say it's suicide. December 1st, 1955, the white prison matron returns to Rosa Parks' cell. She takes Rosa out. Rosa's cellmate watches as they go down the hall. The matron lets Rosa make a call home. Her mother answers and asks, did they beat you? January 2015, inspired by the movie Selma and Black Lives Matter activism, Sandra Bland posts her first Sandy Speaks video on Facebook, proclaiming to her audience, I'm here to change history. She calls them my beautiful kings and queens. June 27th, 2015, Bree Newsom's co-conspirator and ally, James Tyson, puts his hand on the flagpole, telling the state police if they electrify the pole with their tasers, they will electrocute him too. December 1st, 1955, the white matron returns to tell Rosa Parks that her husband and friends have paid her bail and she is free to go. As the matron leads Rosa out of the cell, her cellmate secretly passes her a note with her brother's phone number. As soon as she's home, Rosa calls the woman's brother. June 27, 2015. Bree Newsom comes down from the flagpole safely, having successfully taken down the Confederate flag. The state troopers arrest her immediately for defacing state property. 1849, Harriet Tubman begins planning her escape with her brothers. She has a dream of flying over a river, and then she starts to sink, and she hears the slave catcher's dogs baying for her blood. Then women dressed in white swoop out of nowhere and lift her back up. They carry her to freedom. So I have one more story that I want to tell almost in its entirety as you think about that timeline from Rosa Parks' childhood. And this is one of the first stories she tells in her autobiography, which is titled My Story. She notes that she saw from very early on that, quote, white people didn't treat black children the same as little white children. 
She thought it was unfair from the start. And this issue came to a head very early in her life. This is what she relays in her autobiography. One day when I was about 10, I met a little white boy named Franklin on the road. He said something to me and he threatened to hit me. He balled up his fist as if he was gonna give me a sock. I picked up a brick and dared him to hit me. He thought the better of the idea and went away. But my grandmother scolded me later severely about how I had to learn you don't retaliate if whites did something to you. I got very upset about that. I felt that I was very much in my rights to defend myself if I could. So think about that for a minute. Think of being a 10-year-old girl being threatened on the road and then be told by someone who loves you that you can't defend yourself if a white person threatens you. To realize that the adults who love you cannot protect you from harm or seek justice if that harm is inflicted by a white person. But rather than be shamed, what Rosa learned is this, that as long as white supremacy reigned, her dignity and worth could be sacrificed in any encounter with white people. When Parks narrated this and other encounters, she rejects the racial boundaries and subjugation being imposed by respectability and deference to white supremacy, and she reinvents a black female subject, a pre-civil rights movement subject who in many ways seems post-civil rights movement in the sense that she is already someone who possesses dignity, who demands respect from white people, men, women, or children. She is a black woman who chafes against the recognition that others give her, and then she manipulates those recognitions in her narrative for the purpose of exposing the built-in indignities and injustices of racism. This helps us see a different way of remembering what she did and why she did it and what the results were hoped for and actual. Crafting different ways of remembering black women in the movement generates a usable past that gets us beyond respectability politics to examine what systems of racism do to strip people of their dignity. So my timeline and my talk are not intended to rewrite history to say that respectability politics was not a key or even a good strategy during uh, 19th and 20th century black civil rights movements. What I am trying to do is to re-narrate how we understand key figures in our national memory in order to show why respectability politics is never enough and never can be. In other words, instead of arguing about the content of our character, we need to start talking about the context of structural racism and how high the stakes actually are, life and death for black women and girls in these systems and how both individual and institutional power and choices create and reinforce racial and gender inequality within encounters. To quote Stuart Hall, identity is not only a story, a narrative which we tell ourselves about ourselves. It is stories which change with historical circumstances. And identity shifts with the way in which we think and hear stories and experience them. The timeline of encounters I shared today doesn't map a guaranteed arc towards justice. These women's stories aren't simple sequential stepstones to a post-racial society. These encounters are moments of becoming and previewing and remembering black women who are fierce and sure of the innate dignity of their lives. Looking at moments when their lives were in jeopardy made significantly precarious by a system and actors empowered by that system to deny them basic respect and rights. It's a simultaneously a premonition of and a remembrance of struggle. Thank you.
And respectability politics and, you know, this talk is actually like 80 pages, so <laughs> this is just one slice of it. Um, but I do have a, a very long extended discussion about how this distortion of how we think about slavery um, and not really getting into the depths of the depths of what it really meant um, gives and respectability politics are really tied together. So there's this, this idea, really respectability politics, and if you have a time to read Khalil Gibran Muhammad's on condemnation of blackness, he's the best at explaining this and exploring this sort of indelible tie between blackness and the need for control, controlling blackness. Um, but this idea that black people actually owe white folks so much deference because you actually did us a favor from bringing us over from Africa. Like that is still really deep. And that there's something inherently inferior or if not inherently inferior, this idea that black people are kind of behind in some way and until you catch up, you're not allowed to make any demands, right? And that's really embedded in a lot of the discourse of the 20th century and when we should um, start expanding civil rights, right? And so, so the idea that, um, someone who makes it, right, a black celebrity is not allowed to complain because you've benefited from the system. How could you critique the system, right? You're making all this money. And we see that over and over again. And Sarah Janelle Jackson's um, book on black celebrity and the public sphere goes through like eight different cases of that really nicely. Um, so, you know, those are just some places to look around. But yes, you can never win the respectability politics game because you're not in control of defining respectability. Oh, certainly. I mean, I think ever since it was created as an architecture for trying to, um, in the racial uplift movement, there have been people who have countered respectability politics from within the black public sphere. So you can look at blues artists back at the turn of the century, and you can look at queer folk and unmarried folk and you know, working class folk who were on the wrong end of that stick even uh, related to their middle class uh, black peers, right? And so that's a constant conversation that has been going on, you know, since Reconstruction is, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit of the Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois, right? Like, um, we have to just work hard and learn how to be bricklayers first before we can even think about writing poetry, whereas Du Bois is like, you've already lost the battle if you're thinking that way, right? That your humanity b is based on proving your um, continued economic contribution to the country after having had all of your labor stolen for hundreds of years, right? So, so these are, are arguments that have been going on for quite some time. Yeah, I mean, I alluded to it a little bit with the, um, you know, the dreadlocks case, right? So it's now legal to wear dreadlocks in the workplace across the United States. The courts have decided, just so you know. Um, 
Yeah, and in the military. Yes, so, so now it's all good. <laughs> you won't get written up for that anymore. Um, but this idea of what is, you know, what's the standard of beauty, what's the standard of comportment, all of those things, you know, black women's bodies being masculinized and animalized. I mean, there's a lot of folks who have written about this with Michelle Obama, of course, and the ways that, you know, that kind of exploded at the end of the election um, um, with calling her a gorilla in pumps and things like that. So that's pretty much par for the course um, is part of that. Um, another reason why it's like, if you can't consider o Michelle Obama respectable and beautiful, you know everybody else is never gonna make the, make the cut, right? So, so that's, that's, that's sort of just the example that proves, proves the point, right? Is that an elected congresswoman can still be taken down, right? Can still be attacked in these sorts of ways, right? So that nexus of racism and sexism operating in that way. Oh, I think there was a, okay, sorry. <laughs> Well, I mean, I don't know if we want to do anything about Ben Carson. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I think what my what I'm trying to suggest is that when we narrate history or we receive narrations of history, are we prepared to counter them? I mean, I'm thinking about that moment in the election uh, during the Republican National Convention and Chris Hayes is on a panel and Steve King's there and he says, no other civilization other than European white Westerners has ever done anything to create civilization. And the panel went, and Chris Hayes says, well, we can't debate civilization. I was like, there's no debate here. Algebra, you just need to say algebra, <laughs> right? You just need to say pyramids, algebra, we're good, abacus, Right, I mean, you know, like, just like, get, like, don't you even have like that grammar school example of a non-white Western European cultural important thing that like makes like science possible, right? So, you know, like, like that's the kind of thing I'm talking about is like how shallow is our understanding of our own history because of these obfuscations and because of the ways that discourses of political correctness have completely terrified people, right? Completely terrified people. This argument that to talk about founding fathers as slave owners is tearing America down. And people are like, well, I don't wanna tear America down. I don't wanna, I mean, that's not what I'm doing. And then you get into that argument about whether or not you're tearing America down versus teaching people that George Washington was so keen on keeping his slaves that he rotated them between his plantation and the Philadelphia White House so they could never actually claim freedom in Philadelphia. That is a real commitment to slavery on the first president, right? So why are we not telling those stories and why are we afraid to tell those stories? And if you can pull one of those out of your hat when somebody says something ridiculous versus like, I don't want to call somebody racist. That's not the argument we're having. That's not the argument we're having. So I want to, I want to use different ways of telling stories and picking different ways of relating past and present as a lens, right? As a technique, as a technology. Instead of saying, you all have to read all of the autobiographies that I read, what would we do if you were going to you were gonna instruct somebody to make a web page about why Harriet Tubman and Bree Newsom are alike? Not that they were both really brave and strong, right? Like that's not enough. That's not enough because that makes them to the exceptional individual who proved the rule that nobody else is exceptional, right? So many people are like, well, Harriet Tubman freed a lot of slaves, but all the rest of them, they must have been, you know, they didn't try hard enough to get free. Like, what are you talking about, right? Yeah, and there's a really good book, it's called Guess Who's Coming to Dinner Now, about the rise of using conservatives of color to try to squash um, uh, claims to injustice. So he's just one of the most recent, and just, he's the, I mean, talk about a dissertation generator. Just, just use Ben Carson media appearances, you'll be good. I think there was a hand here and then a hand there. Okay, well then behind you.
Well, I mean. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, those are both wrapped up together. Um, I think it's really interesting and in, uh, that, um, you know, the quote unquote talk, right, um, that, that many parents of color have, particularly black and Latino with children about how to interact with the police, right? And then that gets used as a weapon against them. But the other thing is, wow, that's why I told that last story. What a position to be in, to have to tell your child that you have to give up your dignity to stay alive, right? And I don't know when the system's going to change so that that's not true. And it's unfair, but it's how it is. And I want you to come home. I want you to come home, right? So I separate that discussion, right, out from the ways in which the media do things like, the homeless man who was killed by the white supremacist with a sword, right? He stabbed that man to death with a sword. And they put his criminal record in the first news articles about it. They put the dead man's criminal record. That's not relevant. He was attacked by a maniac with a sword. And you see this with so many of the people who have been killed or assaulted by police, right? It's this idea that there's some sort of equality. Like, we have to balance this out by saying, well, uh, maybe, right? And now we found out that Mike Brown was not involved in any way with a strong arm robbery, right? So whether or not they even have a criminal record, the criminalizing happens in subtle and some overt ways, right? So that's where, you know, this idea that we already have the overarching assumption that the black person must have done something wrong, right? That whatever the behavior that was expected or desired or demanded from the white authority was the right behavior to ask for, and it's the black person's fault for not delivering it, right? And so having to explain that dynamic, right, to a child right, because you want them to come home alive. That is a problem, and that we keep not thinking about why that's a problem, right, um, but thinking about the fear of the parent is never equal to the alleged fear of the stand your ground or the police or whatever, right, right? That fear always trumps the fear of the, the parent and the child, okay? Um, and in terms of the politics of protest, we see all these laws coming out now trying to continue to shrink the acceptable uh, envelope for protest, right? Though all of these, all of these new bills that are coming out, right, that are, are trying to permit more or charge people for extra police. Like if you wanna have a protest, fine, you're gonna pay for the overtime for the police. Like what is that about, right? Um, so I think you know, this is part of a backlash, right? This is part of a backlash um, that is really troubling.
know, I don't, you know, from an audience studies kind of viewpoint, um, and also thinking about popular culture, we never really know how people are remixing these things for themselves. So, you know, cultural appropriation of protest movements goes way back, right? So that's always going to happen. That's a dynamic that is always going to be successful to a certain extent. Um, but whether or not there's still potential there for some sort of activation, or if that's someone's entry point that leads them to another way of thinking about struggle, I'm good with it, right? Like, I'm good with that. Um, I think it's, in some ways, I'm not really concerned about it. I mean, the genie's out of the bottle the first time you create the hashtag or you circulate the picture. Um, I'm more concerned with the dynamics of um, people loving to share death videos. You notice I didn't show a picture of Sandra Bland um, at all. I used Jacob Lawrence pictures and um, the mural. I won't participate in watching people snuffed on camera. Even if I know the circulation of those videos has helped, note how many people have actually been put in prison for these extrajudicial killings. One. And there's already been over 300 people killed by police this year, and it's just the end of March. So there is something going on there that I really think is troubling. Um, that really used to, started with Rodney King. You see a man getting beat nearly to death by four or five people, and still the danger he posed allegedly was enough to let them off. So that's, we are still fighting that dynamic, right? Why did he, why did he try to get up was what people asked. Why did he keep trying to get up? If someone surrounded you with billy club wielding men who were hitting you, would you try to get away from them? Probably. Right, defending yourself as is always seen as an attack, right? In this kind of situation. So I'm much more troubled about the circulation of, of death films than, than um, people co-opting slogans, because that's always happening. 